we're now turning to the period of kingship. Uh, so we're looking at week 10, God's anointed king. And this really is a wonderful time period as we look at King David. And King David is central to the whole storyline of the Old Testament, and especially the promises God makes to him in 2 Samuel 7 and 1 Chronicles 17. Those promises form the background for the entire Old Testament and they help us to understand who Jesus is because he is the king born in fulfillment of God's promises to David some 1,000 years earlier. As we begin our period of kings, I want you to take out the timeline and see where we are within the storyline. And let me give you a little bit of an introduction to the big picture of kings as this will help you to put the individual stories together. First of all, I want you to notice on the timeline that there is the blue crown for kings. And you also have on the timeline a line that runs, we have 12 tribes of Israel, then we have the line of Judah that is blue. And notice that line then continues through David and Solomon, Rehoboam, all the way through the Southern Kingdom. There's also the red crown. The red crown represents Saul and the red crown represents the Northern Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom is what we call illegitimate kings because every king is not from the tribe of Judah. And in 930 BC, we're going to see that we have a divided kingdom, kings in the north, and kings in the south. That gets a little bit complicated as we get there, but we will work our way through by focusing on just a couple of important kings. But for now, let's look at Saul and David. While you have the timeline there, notice what it says about Saul, that he's from the line of Benjamin. That's why his crown is red, not blue. Disobeys God and he is rejected as king and then there is a small crown that says Ishbosheth, Samuel is prophet, and then we're going to come to King David. So that's where we pick up the story. We'll look at the reign of King David, and I'm going to spend some additional time looking at the covenant that God makes. As we look at the period of the United Kingdom, I'd also like you to take out your map at this point and you'll find the map on the United Kingdom gives Saul's kingdom, then it gives David's, and it gives Solomon's. And you'll notice again that Saul's is very small, David's is going to extend significantly, and then the kingdom extends even further north with Solomon. The following map then is going to be of the divided kingdom, but at the moment we want to stay with the united monarchy with David and then Solomon. So that's where we're headed. As we look at the period of Kings, we're now moving to the books of Samuel, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. In terms of the big picture, really the book of Samuel is primarily about Saul, the book of 1st Samuel, because he dies at the end of chapter 1st Samuel, but there are stories of David in between because David is anointed king in 1 Samuel 16. So I just want you to kind of get the sense of that narrative. David is going to be anointed king, but he doesn't become king until a number of years later after the death of Saul. So there's stories about him, but his kingship is taken up in 2 Samuel couple of things about the opening of 1 Samuel 1 to 7, the opening chapters. A couple of things here. First of all, we have the prophet Samuel is going to be born. He's a critical prophet during this time period. He's going to speak to the kings and to God's people. He's going to bring them back to the Lord. We also have uh, Eli and his sons who are serving as priests and you'll notice that Shiloh is the place of the tabernacle. So you could look at Shiloh on your map as well, but that sets the context. 
And basically in these opening chapters, we find out that there is the priesthood is corrupt and there's been idolatry. And God calls Samuel to call God's people back to the Lord. Not only that, but the Philistines come and attack Israel and they take the Ark of the Covenant. So really this is a devastating time and there's great tragedy that happens. But God uses Samuel to call the people back to the Lord in 1 Samuel chapter 7. Samuel says to them in verse 3, If you return to the Lord with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him alone, he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. Verse 4, so the sons of Israel removed the Baals and the Ashtaroth and served the Lord alone. Then in 1 Samuel chapter 8, what you find in this chapter is that the Israelites ask Samuel to appoint a king like the nations. Kingship was God's idea. Deuteronomy chapter 17 gives the details about kingship. But what is wrong here is, first of all, the people want to be like the nations around them. And the second thing is that they are rejecting God as their king. Samuel's very bothered by it. God says, give them what they ask and they get Saul as their first king. But Saul is a military guy but he cares more about the people's impression of him than he does about following the Lord. And there are two stories, one in 1 Samuel 13 and one in 1 Samuel 15, which underscore kind of the heart of Saul that he doesn't fully follow God's commands. And so the kingdom is going to be taken away from him. Then you have 1 Samuel chapter 16, while Saul is still king, in 1 Samuel 16, God tells Samuel to go to the house of Jesse. And it says in chapter 16, verse 1, I'm going to send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite from Bethlehem. Remember, we've spoken about the importance of Bethlehem. And David is going to be anointed king. And the language to anoint is where we get the, the term Messiah. The verb mashach, mashiach. This is where we get the language of Messiah. And the Messiah simply means anointed one. So don't miss the messianic overtones, even in 1 Samuel chapter 16, because the king is going to be called God's anointed one. The whole chapter that follows from verse chapter 17 onwards what we see here is conflict between the house of Saul and the house of David. David defeats the Philistine named Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17 Saul gets jealous and there's conflict that happens requiring David to flee for his life. He's not going to be anointed king until the death of Saul in 1 Samuel 31. And then he's going to be made king over Judah in 2 Samuel chapter 7, while Ishbosheth is king. And then it's not until 2 Samuel chapter 5 that David is made king over all Israel. In all these difficult years in between, they were God's training ground because the king was learning. David was learning to trust in God. And David was learning that God was his refuge and strength. And they were the preparation years for the leadership that would follow. 2 Samuel chapter 5, David then becomes king over all Israel. In that chapter, he also captures Jerusalem and makes it the capital, this is an important moment. It really kind of climaxes the whole conquest of the land. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, the Ark of the Covenant is going to be brought into Jerusalem. And then in chapter 7, 
This is where I want to pause for a few moments. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, David wants to build a temple for God. And Nathan the prophet, God tells Nathan, no, he's not the one who's going to build it. His son is going to build it. And this is going to come to fulfillment with Solomon because God chooses Solomon, a man of rest, to build the temple. But in this chapter in 2 Samuel 7, in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, and there are several Psalms, is what we find the Davidic covenant. You cannot spend enough time in this chapter. I spend significant time on this chapter and these promises in the study guide. I go through each one of the promises because they form the background for the entire Old Testament and they help us to understand who Jesus is. I just want to focus on a couple of verses. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 to 17. That's really the section that deals with the covenant. And God makes promises to David. This is given unconditionally. Unlike the Mosaic Covenant, God doesn't say to David, if you obey me and if you keep my commandments, they're given unconditionally. He mentions in verse 9, I have been with you wherever you have gone. I've made your name great. Verse 10, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. Verse 11, I will give you rest from all your enemies. That's in preparation for the temple that will be built. And the book of Chronicles is going to describe some of the military battles that take place. That God is defeating Israel's enemies. And then they're going to have rest in preparation for Solomon. Verse 12 is very, very important and what follows. And I'm going to read it. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers... I will raise up your descendant after you. Let me pause for a moment. That term descendant is in Hebrew, zerah, seed. The passage in Chronicles says one of your sons in 1 Chronicles 17. So seed, this was the same seed language we saw in Genesis chapter 15. I will raise up your seed after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. In 1 Chronicles 17, God says the kingdom is God's kingdom. You see, the Davidic king is going to be given rulership over the kingdom of the Lord. Verse 13, he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men. But, verse 15, my loving kindness shall not depart from him. Verse 16, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Now I'd like you to open and turn to the timeline again and I want you to see the promises that are listed in quick summary form on the timeline. Look at David. What we have so far, we have the blue crown. We have God's chosen king from the line of Judah. That's, that's referring to 1 Samuel chapter 16. He is anointed by Samuel in Bethlehem, 1 Samuel 16. Jerusalem becomes the holy city and the capital, 2 Samuel chapter 5, and now the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7. And I've written here, everlasting throne, everlasting kingdom, son of God relationship. That means the promise, I will be a father to him and he will be my son. Psalm 2 also talks about the son, the king is just, it's an identity for the son, to the king. He's called God's son. The son will build the temple. The covenant cannot be broken. That's picking up Jeremiah later, we'll say. The covenant cannot be broken. And then God's grace in spite of sin, which I'll talk about in a moment. 
I want you then to notice the timeline, David, Solomon, and look at all the kings on the lower portion of the timeline that runs all the way through, notice all the way through 586, and then the line is almost looks like it fades, but it is going to be taken up through Zerubbabel, and then the arrow points to the Messiah. And we're not doing the New Testament study at this point, but if you had the New Testament timeline, you will see that it connects at exactly that point and it's going to point to the Messiah because Jesus is ultimately the fulfillment of the promises God makes to David. Not only is he going to be born in Bethlehem and there's all kinds of promises that are made and prophecies that underscore that he is the son. But even his death and resurrection are going to be the fulfillment of the promises made. Because there are a couple of, <clears throat> a couple of passages, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 13, and these are some sermons and they refer back to the promises God made to David. And there are several Psalms that are listed. And what it means is that when God says, I will raise up your seed, that in the big picture of the redemptive story, this is anticipating God raising up Jesus at the resurrection. And those passages in Acts are going to refer back to that and talk about the resurrection of Jesus in connection with the Davidic promise. So it really is wonderful. As the story continues in the book of Samuel, the book in Chronicles picks up some of the military victories showing that the kingdom is expanding. And then we also have in these stories of in chapter 11 and 12, we have the story of David and Bathsheba. David orchestrates the murder of Uriah. He commits adultery with Bathsheba. And Nathan the prophet is going to come and rebuke him. And David is going to repent in chapter 12. This story is also recounted in Psalm 32, where David recognizes the blessing of the one who has been forgiven, and this is going to be quoted in Romans chapter 4. You also see his repentance in Psalm 51, and this reminds us that God's promise to David that he will always have a son on the throne was not based on David's obedience but it is based on the faithfulness of God. This story is a great example that reminds us of that. Then in chapter 12, we have Solomon who is born as well. And that then, I wanna move now to 1 Chronicles, chapters 22 to 29, because Chronicles is going to take up the story with Solomon. And in these chapters, in 1 Chronicles 22 to 29, David is going to warn Solomon that he needs to be careful to follow God's laws. David prepares the kingdom for the reign of his son. He's going to establish musicians, wonderful worship, He's going to establish commanders and military leader and counselors. He's organizing the kingdom in preparation for Solomon when he becomes king. And then I want to look at the last chapter of Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 29. This is one of my favorite chapters in Chronicles because what you see at the end of David's life he has seen the mercy and grace of God in his life. And he knows who God is. And at the end of his life, you find this wonderful prayer 
where he recognises that everything has come from God. And he says, verse 14, who am I? That was the same language when God made promises to him. He recognised he was unworthy for all that God had done. He says, verse 14, he's, who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer as generously as this for all things have come from you and from your hand we have given to you. Verse 15, for we are sojourners before you, tenants as all our forefathers, our days on earth are like a shadow. See, he recognises that they are temporary times because he's looking forward to something else. He gives to the Lord of his resources and then the end of Chronicles, Solomon sits on the throne, verse 23, then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David. And this really leads us to the end of the life of David and we move now to the transition to Solomon as king. And he is going to be the temple builder and we're going to be looking at the temple and the prayer that's being offered in the temple.